Welcome to the Uncommon Freedom Show. Our purpose is to equip and inspire you to reach your potential, maximize your impact, and live a great life while you make the world a better place. I'm Kevin. And I'm Becca. We're your hosts. In this episode, we are talking about money management with kids and why it's so important to start teaching them about finances early in life. So an interesting statistic for all of us is that about 50% of Americans don't have a savings account with at least $400 to cover a financial emergency. Teaching kids now helps form habits that can lead to a better relationship with money as adults. And major decisions like buying a car or getting that first job or apartment often all happen before the age of 25. Teens who haven't started to learn about the best ways to manage money but need to make major purchases are at high risk of making poor decisions that can plunge them into debt. Boy, is that true. Yeah. Well, Beck, we are winding down our parenting series. It's been fun. We had a couple of interviews with some very experienced parents and learned a lot. I was wondering what is either something that you've learned or something that you've applied from a parenting perspective over the last few months? So I've loved everything our guests have shared, but we also had a really poignant conversation with Danny and Sherry Silk a couple weeks ago, and they have tons of resources. And I know Danny's authored multiple books, but the one that has really stuck out to me right now in life is Loving on Purpose. And it was just amazing to sit down with them and kind of understand how that works. And I've been applying it into parenting. One child in particular keeps giving us plenty of opportunities. And it's for me, it's to step out of emotion uh, to preserve our relationship and to keep from going into like nagging, reminding and lecturing, which I've always known those are not ways that I wanted to parent, but it's very hard, especially with teenagers, not to get into that vein when it's repeat offenders on the same things. And I never feel good about it when it's done. I never feel like I've actually communicated in a way that's necessarily going to change their behavior and evidence shows it is not. Need to read the book, uh, guys, go out and get Loving on Purpose if you haven't read it or listen to the audiobook and start to work on the principles of it. But it really empowers the child to take personal ownership for what's missing in the equation of relationship, choices and you know outcomes and things like that. And so we're still a very much a work in progress on this. But for me, it's been a very fun experiment in shifting the tone of my parenting. That's great. And for me, um, probably the thing that I've applied the most is in my interview with Mike and Glory Storms, Mm -hmm. they talked about the fact that you have to address the issue and implement consequences, which ideally are natural consequences or something that flow from the poor choice that was made, but also not hold it against the child. Like Mm -hmm. Mike used the example of, hey, um, you screwed up. You made some poor choices with your phone. Um, you know, that means you lose your phone, but you want to go play some catch or do you want to go get some ice cream? Right. Um, it to just focus on keeping the relationship like mm-hmm. punishment or consequences aren't to be mean. Yeah. And to detract from the relationship, they're just they're a way to teach people and they're natural consequences for a reason. But it doesn't mean we I still can't be your dad and we still can't have fun together. So. That's really good. And I think, again, it complements a lot of what Loving on Purpose is about as well. So I Absolutely. think, you know, as parents, you sometimes wonder, like, how far to go and, um, you know, to take the consequences and how to really teach them a lesson. But then when we start removing relationship, I think that causes harm. Awesome. That's well, really should we move back to finances? Yes. Yeah, so one of our family tenants is prosperity with a purpose. But as we've just introduced, prosperity does not just happen. It takes hard work and careful financial management in line with our goal of raising healthy, happy responsible adults we want our kids to grow up understanding the value of a dollar and give them a strong base for responsible money management you know i'm reading the book x and Mm -hmm. i believe the subtitle is multiply your god-given potential by one of my favorite authors john bevere Mm -hmm. and i have a group of men that i meet with twice a month and we're going through this book and it really has to do with multiplication and stewardship Um, much from a kind of a a skill or a financial kind of a career, just an impact standpoint. Um, But the chapter that we are reviewing today talked about the fact that if I'm discontent for material things or things that I selfishly want, that's wrong. But if I'm not content because of wanting more impact or justice in the world, then that's a good thing. Mm. And as we talk about prosperity with a purpose, I think it's okay to want, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted a Corvette and now I have 
a Corvette or two, but those have come been paid for by cash. And honestly, I could after afford a long time of waiting, after a very long time of waiting yeah. and could afford a fancy European, you know, sports car instead, but I've chosen to be more modest, which some people might not think applies to Corvette. But when you spend, you know, what I did versus three or four or five times as much, but, and because so that we can do other things with Relatively, it, yes. but just that concept of prosperity with a purpose to be able to do good in the world. And I think is when we do more good, um, you know, God wants to bless us. And that's our goal with kids. So one of the things that we've done is to start them young. And do you want to talk about some of the chores that we've done and how we've implemented paying our kids, not just for existing, but for being, for working and learning the value of getting paid to do work? Right. Well, what's interesting to me is how often I hear that like teenagers don't have chores to do, um, not to mention elementary age kids. And so we've actually started our children very young, right around four years old. We have them do age appropriate chores. And one of the things that, you know, Evie's been able to do for the last couple of years right now, she's five and a half is she does the dishwasher and she helps with her own laundry. I mean, I still know a lot of parents, no shame for, you know, no shame out there. If you're doing your kids laundry, maybe for you, it's a labor of love or an act of love, or you have practical reasons, but we really want to challenge you. Our kids have been doing their own laundry for years and Evie does her own laundry with help. So basically she brings down her hamper, she throws it in the washing machine. We obviously do the soap and um, then she pushes the buttons, which is really fun. And then when it's washed, she comes back in, pulls it out of the washer, throws it up into the dryer. And then once we put it back in the basket, she takes it back to her room and then someone helps her put it away and totally age appropriate for five years old. And so we're training her that as soon as she can do the soap on her own, I mean, and then she'll need help, you know, reaching things, but that's how we move her towards being responsible for her own things. And then with the dishwasher, you know, she does the silverware every day and the big boys do all the heavy breakable stuff. And uh, it's a great arrangement. It is. And the cool thing is, I think we really kind of formalized her taking over the silverware on a daily basis. I think it was at the beginning of this year when we yeah. redid the checklists that we have for the kids. And the cool thing is um, there's many mornings where either on a weekend she wakes up and she just gets it done. Right. Especially if the dishwasher is already clean and open as a reminder for her. Or if I'm getting her ready for school, I get her dressed and I might be in my office for a minute and I come back out to get her breakfast and the dishwasher's done. So it's really important to get them started young and to, like you said, make them age appropriate and add to the tasks um, right. when it's appropriate. And the truth is at this young age too, the other thing is most of you would realize that your kids actually like to do chores and like to help out. So they actually think it's fun. Um, I think Evie only complains right now because she hears older brothers complain about things. Right. And so she assumes and, you know, carries on that, uh, takes in that mindset. But originally it was very fun for her to put the silverware away and really fun for the laundry. And even now she makes a game out of it. When she pulls her stuff out of the washing machine and throws it up into the dryer, it might take her 15 minutes. So you have to have that permission for imperfection and that patience when you have young children do a job, even when you have teenagers do a job, can I get a shout out? But again, what's the point, perfection or training? And for us it's training and so whenever possible, no matter how many times we have to ask that particular person to come back and put their thing away or put the glass in the dishwasher that or they leave out every day. It's important for us, our family values, that they just do the job right. And so if we have to have them do it two or three times, you know, under normal circumstances, that's going to happen. We're not just going to do it for them. And I think one of the conversations that we have with our, especially our older two kids, but even Dylan, because he's old enough, mm -hmm. is, hey, we're training you to be an employee or an entrepreneur. You know, at some point you're going to work for someone, either you're an entrepreneur and your customer is the person that's paying you, or you have a typical job, you're working for a boss. Right. And that how you do things in the home is how you'll do things there. How you do one thing is how you do. And you're in competition with right. someone else. So if, mm. you know, if you do dishes in a sloppy manner, and they have to be redone and your boss is constantly having to ask you, remind you to do things over or correct it. If someone else is there doing a better job, you're going to lose out to them. Yeah. And like you said, with kids, have fun with it. Like be willing to slow down. Obviously, sometimes we just have to do things because it needs to be done. Right. Um, but like laundry, just let her have fun. Like don't. And that's actually great training for kids to learn. You know what? Work can be fun. 
part of it is just a mindset thing. And the right. other is, you know, we want people to learn how to do something that they enjoy. Life shouldn't be about working a job that you hate for 40, 50 years until you can retire and then basically rot away. Right. And then with our older boys who've been doing their own laundry for years now, I mean, again, there are grown adults that don't necessarily totally understand how to run a washing machine or how to do laundry properly. Um, our boys run their own laundry. They have four years. And the beautiful thing about that is transferring the ownership of you don't have any clean clothes, man, you know, you're supposed to be doing your laundry on the weekends. We don't want you running one thing in the washing machine, which happens occasionally when we don't catch them. Um, and so, you know, when you're going to do your laundry or when you want it done and when it needs done and you're fully responsible for it. And when you can't find something, it's likely because you didn't put it where it went or you didn't put it where it should go and you haven't been stewarding your own clothing well. But that's not on us. Nope. It uh, gives us a lot of freedom. Yeah. All right. The next thing is commission versus allowance. And I think we probably got this terminology from Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. Yeah. Um, yeah. I grew up getting an allowance. It was a very nominal. I don't think I always did. Sometimes I did. Yeah. And I don't know how consistent my allowance yeah. was. But we love the concept that our kids have to earn something. And so what we implemented, once again, they were young. It even has this, is an age-appropriate checklist. Because what we want to do is correlate work with getting paid. Right. And there's some things that they do just because they're part of the family. We don't pay them for everything that they do. But we do have chores that they get paid to do. And what we've ultimately evolved to is a checklist where if you do it, you get paid. If you don't, you don't get paid. And honestly, many times, if you don't do it when it's supposed to be done, you're still going to do it. And you're not going to get paid for it. Right. Because that's a life lesson, right? If you don't do your taxes... You're still going to have to pay them, but you're also going to have to pay a penalty for that. Or we'll pay a sibling to do the job for you. Or Absolutely. Not, not we won't. Right. Well, you will technically because we take what we would give to you and that compensation goes to the sibling who completed the chore. Absolutely. All right. The next one is giving generously first, saving wisely second, and spending responsibly last. Ooh, that's a big one. We have not nailed this with our children yet, by the way. Just our vision. We're trying, but I remember... Better to aim at this than to aim at nothing. Exactly. And I remember hearing a podcast, uh, I think it was a couple, and they were talking about uh, teaching their kids to give. And this is something that kind of shifted how we did giving with our kids, especially when they're young. You know, obviously, we believe a tithe is 10%. You know, even in today's New Testament living, there's people who argue, well, the Testament isn't actually what's required today. I don't know. We just like that as a rule of thumb. What we've done with our kids is we give them a dollar per age, um, and then it increases once they're a teenager. But so Evie's five, so she gets $5 a week. And tithing 50% or... 50 cents of, you know, that, which is 10% of $5 is a little bit cumbersome. And what I heard on this podcast is, listen, we want it to be more about the act and the training. And so we just simplified it to, hey, you're earning, you're giving $1 every week to tithing, to giving. And the other thing that we did uh, early on, we initially had them, we went to church and a lot of, you know, kids who go to Sunday school, they have a little tithing box there. Uh, but we shifted away from that because when kids give to a church, a lot of times they don't see the impact that happens. And what we've shifted to is they can choose where their giving money goes. So over the years, we've done a couple of missions trips. We've built homes in Mexico. We went to Kenya. Um, we've had some friends that became missionaries and just other ministries that we've supported that our kids have observed. And so when they accumulate their tithe, it's like, hey, it's time to give it where do you want to give it I love to. that actually part of it because it, each of our kids have chosen differently, haven't they? They have. Yeah. It's rare that all three of them give to the same ministry at the same time. You know, two of them might choose to give to the same place, but uh, it's really cool because uh, they get the decision and it also, it just me shows them. To them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't we have a story about when Evie was uh, a couple, like maybe a year or so ago and going to church and she wanted to bring tithe, but then she didn't want to bring her own money? Absolutely. Tell that story. That's a good one. Yeah, I vaguely remember it, but um, I think what we've been... Uh, church shopping for about three years. So uh, I don't even remember exactly where it was, but I remember there was one church, I think, that did a good job of really encouraging the kids to bring in, you know, a tithe. And so Evie was all on board with bringing in the tithe. But then when I talked to her about it being her money, it was like, no, I don't want to bring my money. I want to bring your money. It's like, well, that's not how it works. Mom and dad already tithe. 
but this is what you um, need to do. And she's actually shifted quite a bit. Yeah, she's a very generous person, actually. She is. and um, But it's, once again, giving your kids a couple bucks as they walk into church really doesn't do anything no. to instill a spirit of giving and sacrifice right. into our kids. Right. All right. Uh, saving wisely. So we have our kids also save. And one thing that we learned the hard way is, you know, a year ago, one of our kids got their first like real job right. and we were wrestling with the whole emancipate your child and kind of decided to give them their freedom. They knew they were saving for a very big purchase that or was needed yep. they, or they should have been. And yep. that was the point of a lot of the work hours that they were putting in. Yeah. And over the course of the couple months that they had it, and then when we got his right through the tax fingers. statement, yeah. uh, had earned a decent amount right. and had literally none of it left. So with our younger kids, we do teach them to save and it's a small percent. So Evie's earning $5 a week, $1 goes to give, one to maybe $2 goes to save. Um, and then, you know, we have bank accounts for all the kids and that just gets set aside for them. And they're not all saving for a car at the age of five, you know, right. it's for something bigger down the road. Uh, but just teaching them the discipline of saving on the front end is really important. Although we wish we could have done last year a little bit differently with that child and yes. probably had more accountability and a requirement for a certain portion to be saved so that it wasn't an entirely wasted summer last year of, yeah. of earning. Um, I do think, and we've talked about this, that we would much rather they learn this lesson at 15 or 13 or 14 than at 27 and they can't pay the rent and you know they're now homeless. So Spot. having those lessons early on and then saying this year, we're going to do it differently. We're going to help you, but also hopefully you're changed and you understand. And really that child has done a good job with our help, but also just even knowing that with every paycheck, a lot of it's going to be set aside and, and even bringing that money to us automatically to get to put into savings. Absolutely. And then spending responsibly, that one, I guess the bottom line is we've really decided with their spending money is it is their spending money. Right. So obviously we recently had- Responsibly is a very uh, subjective term. Yeah, I think obviously, you know, we recently- We had, don't think candy and- Yeah, I mean, the reality is, you know, especially in a healthy right. home like ours, candy is what most of the kids, especially when they're younger, that's what they want to buy with their money. Yeah. Um, Legos, toys, things like that. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, for us, the parameters really focus on not too much junk food or sugar. Right. And also just that the purchases need to fall in line with our values. Family so values whether that's, uh, you can't buy any book or magazine that you want. You can't buy any type of music that you want. Um, but the spending is really up to them. And then clothing, obviously, you know, we right. don't deal so much with inappropriate with boys, you know, they just wear t-shirts, shorts, and pants, but um, definitely the logos and what that represents matters to us. And we've had those conversations as well this year. So plenty of life lessons along the way yeah and then the last thing is just you know what this looks like at different ages mm -hmm. and uh you know very curious on getting feedback from our audience here because yeah. uh, my men's group that i was talking about earlier last time we met together we talked about this and what we've decided to do with our kids is that the money that they earn from us for their commission they have to tithe like the giving is non-negotiable but what we've ultimately decided to do so far, and we may change at some point, is to allow our kids, you know, tithing on their income earned outside the home is up to them. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with this because I do believe, and Rabbi Daniel Appen in his book, Thou Shall Prosper, talks about the fact that tithing is like a universal principle. Right. There are atheists who tithe, and there's research out there that shows that tithing brings a greater sense of mental health and just peace of mind um, and potentially even wealth benefits like it does come back to you it is a stewardship principle and so on the one hand it's tempting to say well this is what we do but on the other hand um, we also you know god loves a cheerful giver right and so i think where we're at now is having a conversation of man i hate to see you miss out on the blessing of god just taking that 10 percent and doing something incredible with it but it has to be theirs. And we want it to be a willing heart. And right. so really we're, what we're saying is we're praying for the hearts of our children, for them to be more generous. Um, they are generous in some aspects, but I would say, you know, not necessarily with the paychecks they're earning outside of our home right now. 
Um, so yeah, we would love to hear your feedback about how you handled it in your family or what you think biblically makes sense. And I think uh, the biggest thing for us is just encouraging all of you as parents to really, like it's never too late, better late than never, mm -hmm. um, but to really be intentional about your conversations and training of financial stewardship with your kids. I've talked about this before, certainly with our kids, but when I graduated from high school, I walked into the student union at the University of Akron. Uh, that place, you know, the first week of class was crawling with credit card uh, tables and they were just desperate to give it out to, you know, naive freshmen and beyond. And I got my Discover card. I actually still have the original card. I actually, we haven't used it in years, um, but I went into a couple thousand dollars of debt rather quickly. And because I didn't have a great earning potential and I was going to school, it took me a long time to pay off that debt. Um, and I remember once we got engaged, it was weighing on me even more heavily because we had a honeymoon to pay for and the move to Oregon. And I don't remember really having a ton of conversations with my parents. Maybe I did. And maybe I was just a stupid, you know, 19 year old or 18 year old and just gonna wouldn't have matter what conversations I had. Uh, but also, I don't think I had a debit card. I don't know, maybe they weren't even popular back then, but just right. to practice that. And we've all of our kids have like I had cards. a checking account that I had to yeah. work to budget. You know, I don't know that we did a ton of it, but I was taught some of that along the way. Yeah, but just, it's so important to have those conversations. Do you remember what kids. you bought with that Discover card that got you into debt? Like, oh, it was, was it lots of pairs of red jeans? And I think uh, the biggest thing for us is just encouraging all of you as parents to really, like it's never too late, better late than never, mm -hmm. um, but to really be intentional about your conversations and training of financial stewardship with your kids. I've talked about this before, certainly with our kids, but when I graduated from high school, I walked into the student union at the University of Akron. Uh, that place, you know, the first week of class was crawling with credit card uh, tables and they were just desperate to give it out to, you know, naive freshmen and beyond. And I got my Discover card. I actually still have the original card. I actually, we haven't used it in years, um, but I went into a couple thousand dollars of debt rather quickly. And because I didn't have a great earning potential and I was going to school, it took me a long time to pay off that debt. Um, and I remember once we got engaged, it was weighing on me even more heavily because we had a honeymoon to pay for and the move to Oregon. And I don't remember really having a ton of conversations with my parents. Maybe I did. And maybe I was just a stupid, you know, 19 year old or 18 year old and just gonna, wouldn't have matter what conversations I had. Uh, but also, I don't think I had a debit card. I don't know, maybe they weren't even popular back then, but just right. to practice that and we've, all of our kids have debit cards. Like I had cards. a checking account that I had to yeah. work to budget. You know, I don't know that we did a ton of it, but I was, I was taught some of that along the way. Yeah, um, but just, it's so important to have those conversations. Do you remember what you bought with that Discover card that got you into debt? Like, oh, it was, was it lots of pairs of red jeans? Uh, not red jeans uh, back then, okay, um, we'll although it might have been, because colored jeans were actually quite popular in the 90s. Oh, so, yeah. but yeah, most of it was spent on uh, clothing and just probably, you know, dining out with friends and honestly, stupid stuff that wasn't worth it. But the good thing is, and this is where it's also important to let your kids fail when they're young is yes. I learned my lesson. Yes. I probably had my credit card debt paid off by the time, certainly by the time we were married um, at 21. So really, and that was the last time I've ever, and I don't think you ever have no. made any type of interest payments and, you know, got caught behind. So our income has been working for us, even our tiny, tiny income. In the early days. For a long time, because yeah. we haven't had debt. Let your kids fail. And that's ultimately, that's what happened with our son last year, is on the one hand, we could have forced him to save, but when he got his tax statement from his employer and looked at it and we said, how much of that is available? It's like, none of it. It all got Very wasted little. on Uber Eats and- Fortnite. Yeah good goofy yeah. things so uh, just as we wrap up quick reminder is start them young we really want to encourage all of you to teach your kids the value of earning money in the form of a commission versus an allowance and then learn to give generously first save wisely second and then spend responsibly with what's remaining 
And then to just make sure that all of your financial training is age appropriate mm. with your kids. So good. Hey, we would really appreciate a five-star review. So if you would go in and just take a minute to do that and then share this episode or our podcast with someone that you know who you think would benefit, that would be great. So thank you for listening to the Uncommon Freedom Show. We believe freedom isn't man's invention. It was created by God. You can connect with us at beckandkev.com for more resources to learn biblical principles, essential disciplines, and winning habits that help once average people lead the life they want instead of accepting the life they were given. 